Welcome to this Give Me 15 Minute Education Program for Medical Professionals. My name is Jennifer Searfoss, and I am the CEO of the Searfoss Consulting Group. To help you spell my last name, the company is also called SCG Health. We opened our doors in 2011, and we focused our client services on value improvement, revenue cycle management, and strategic planning in this post-health reform world. Since 2016, we are a Medicare Qualified Clinical Data Registry, and we help you send your data to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as part of the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. This presentation will address what you need to know about that Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, MIPS, and the Low Volume Exception. This session, along with many others, is available for free as a video archive on YouTube. SCG Health also offers in-person conferences on many topics, including coding, documentation, compliance, and EMR implementation. Learn more at scghealth.com. One quick legal note, while I am an attorney, I'm not your attorney, so please understand that none of the information contained in this presentation should be construed as legal advice for your practice. I encourage you to contact your own legal counsel if you have any questions regarding state or federal law that apply to the concepts covered in this session. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to do a quick refresher uh, just on the merit-based incentive payment system, and then I've got a quick uh, poll, if you will, uh, for those of you that are on the live session. So uh, just as a reminder, the merit-based incentive payment system uh, does have two different sort of a, a transition year and then 2018. Um, so I'm going to cover both in this session. For 2017, that is the performance year. It is a two-year lag. It is a 4% cut on 2019 Medicare receipts. And the weighting for 2017 performance is on 60% quality, 25% meaning excuse me, meaningful use or advancing care information, and 15% improvement activities. For those uh, clinicians who happen to be in this other non-facing, patient-facing uh, clinician or non-physician practitioner area, uh, in the center here we've highlighted it's an 85% reweighting for you because the advancing care information or meaningful use is pulled out. You didn't have incentive funds, that stimulus package, to adopt an EMR, and more than likely you're actually at the will of the physicians in your department or uh, running your company. So uh, that's what the reweighting is. Still, there's 15% for improvement activities. And in 2017, it's just do something. If you report any one measure, you'll receive three points and not have that 4% penalty. And 2018 is very different. The minimum is 15 points. And the weighting on that for 2018 performance year, which is a 5% cut on 2020 Medicare receipts, is 50% quality. Advancing care information is 25, improvement activities 15, and cost is 10. So where they got the new cost category, that 10% is out of quality. And so the reweighting for non-patient-facing clinicians and non-physician practitioners is to 75% because that cost is still going to be there so long as you've been attributed patients. So that's a whole other conversation that we could have about that. But that's what the merit-based incentive payment system is about. If you remember these weights. So the first question everyone should be asking is, what does it mean if you don't have to do this? What if you don't have this headache? Well, the most common exception that's out there is the low volume exception. And that's the purpose of today's session is to talk about this exception, the low volume exception. So let's start for the 2017 performance year. The way that they look at this, Medicare, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is going to do an evaluation. And they're going to do an evaluation on whether or not you meet a two-part test. So the first question is, did you receive or receive $30,000 or more in Medicare receivables? Or did you see 100 Medicare patients during the first period we're going to look at? And that first period was September 1, 2015 to August 31, 2016. So a very, again, annual period, but it's straddling a year. And then the next one was September 1, 2016 to August 31, 2017. So very interesting on both of those. Now, in either one of those time periods, if you met either one of the 100 Medicare patients or the $30,000, any time you hit that, that would mean that you were accepted from the program. You don't have to do MIPS. Instead, you keep doing what you're doing. Now, there isn't a market basket update. Remember that that's going away. 
So if you want to continue to make the same money as you were making in the past with that market basket update, the only way that you'd be able to do that is to participate in MIPS. Now, the question is, can you voluntarily participate in MIPS to get that uh, market basket update? And the answer right now is no. Um, but I'll tell you how you could get that update if you wanted to. So to look up your participation status, if you didn't receive a letter or maybe it went to a, a bank mailbox or whatever, um, the letters were sent out, but you can go and look it up at qpp.cms.gov. It's on the front page of their uh, website. Or if you wanna go to participation-lookup, you can do that as well. And all you need to put in there is your national provider identifier. If you don't know what your NPI is, you can look it up yourself. Feel free to just click on that link and it'll bring you over to something called NIPSI or NPES, whatever we want to call it, and you can look up your national provider identifier. The status is particular to an NPI and TIN, so if you practice at multiple locations, the information there will show you the data that they have for multiple locations and whether or not you need to uh, report. So uh, just a quick poll that I'm going to take for everyone who's in the participating online. Um, I would like to just get your feedback on how prepared you feel right now on um, on this uh, on MIPS. Uh, so just a couple seconds, I'm going to let you vote on that um, because I do want to get some uh, feedback on MIPS for 2017, especially as we're looking at new programming that we're going to provide uh, for you in the uh, in the coming year. So uh, just a couple more seconds here on this poll. If you could please participate, that would be great uh, for those of you that are in the live session. Otherwise, I am going to move on here in just one moment. Um, so for more information about 2017 MIPS and what you need to uh, learn more about, um, feel free to definitely check out the SCG Health uh, website and uh, also our YouTube videos. We have one on MIPS math, for example, because it is calculus at this point. All right, well, so I'm seeing about a third of you are stressed out about MIPS, which uh, in many ways makes sense. Um, and then uh, the rest of you are getting prepared. You're not already submitting your data. You're not very prepared, but you're feeling like you're getting there. So excellent. I'm glad this can be a part of feeling prepared. For those of you that are stressed out, we're going to do our best to make this easy for you. So let's talk about the calendar year 2018. Since we are now in the 2018 calendar year for performance, they've broadened the low volume exception. So let's go over this again, same elements as before. So if you saw patients in, uh, it's gonna be from September 1, 2017 to August 31, 2018. So that's gonna be a period they look at, but also September 1, 2018. 16 to August 31, 2017, that same period that we looked at previously, they're going to look at that and they will figure out, CMS will figure out if you saw, and this is where it gets different, if you saw 200 patients, so we are doubling on the number of patients for 2018, 200 patients and $90,000 in Medicare receivables. So this is a, a much broader. Um, we do feel if you were exempted 2017, you likely are exempted 2018 unless you dramatically changed your practice. So for new clinicians, this might be an area that changed. But also if you reported in 2017, um, you may or may not actually need to report in 2018. So don't make that assumption. But we'll go into, if you're looking to make that market basket update, uh, what you can do. And that all really comes down to group reporting. So this would be for uh, organizations that have two or more eligible clinicians. You do need to have two. If you're a solo, uh, this wouldn't be available to you. But group reporting is when you report under one tax identification number. And so if you report under one tax identification number, then exclusions and exceptions don't count. I'll talk about both of those. Because the eligible encounters for your denominators will include everybody, including those clinicians with low volume exceptions, but also other exemptions, um, and also the performance will as well. So the aggregated data has to reflect everybody. So let's use this first example for a group of CRNAs. Um, let's start off with its four clinicians in the group, so four CRNAs in this organization, and by definition, CRNAs, Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetists, are included in the MIPS program. So by definition, they're in. But we go and do a search, and the national provider identifiers for two of the clinicians show that they have a low volume exception. So two out of the four have an exception. So here are the options. 
Option number one is report data individually only for those two clinicians. Now, the receipts for the other two clinicians not reported, while they won't have a penalty, they're not going to have a market basket update. And year over year, the um, conversion factor, that update to the program, as the program grows more Medicare beneficiaries, all reimbursement has to slightly go down. So we may be talking that, you know, by an RVU, we're talking a penny, but that does mean that receipts will over time go down. Your, your money to, from Medicare will go down over time. So just keep that in mind that the only way to get market basket update is to, in this instance, your option to report as a group so that the bonus applies to everyone in the tax identification number. And again, that's if you want to go for a bonus in 2017, most of us are just going for a zero update because that's uh, really what you want on the table. So um, if you're going to report as a group with data for all four clinicians, remember that uh, it needs to reflect more than 50% of all clinicians, which means that um, you would need to include all of the clinicians. Now, you may be able to if you've got moonlighters. Um, if you're looking for ways that maybe the data wasn't there, you have a really poor workflow, or as we've seen, we have some old dogs who don't want to learn new tricks. Remember, the data for quality needs to reflect more than 50%, so in my brain, I'd say 51% of your data. And that maybe if it's a low volume clinician that you can go ahead and look at, well, it was only for, you know, 4% of all of your eligible encounters and you're still su submitting some great data. It's just not reflecting them. So maybe some options that you have out there to begin to limit your, uh, your exposure for um, clinicians that may not be really doing what they need to be doing on capturing data. So my second example is from multi-specialty bone health organization with 46 clinicians. Um, bone health would be um, orthopods, so uh, both the physicians who see patients and some of your, your major surgeons. Um, it could include uh, podiatrists. It could include chiropractic. I've seen one that included acupuncture. Um, we're talking physical therapy, occupational therapy, very, very broad organization. And let's, for just sake of this example, say the group includes nine physical therapists and occupational therapists, uh, four clinicians that fall under the low volume exception, and a brand new physician, brand new, right out of fellowship, who's never been enrolled in the Medicare program until they join your group. So not new to the group, new to the entire field of medicine. And uh, there is an exception for new physicians as well. So. Your options here are to report individually by national provider identifier and tax identification number. So individually, each clinician, they make or break themselves, which may, again, for performance um, and also data capture, may be an incentive that you want to have for your organization. And you would report that for your 32 clinicians. Your option two, however, would be to report as a group for all of the data for all of the 46 clinicians. Now, a way here also to limit your exposure, especially right now, uh, a number of physical therapists and occupational therapists have heard over and over and over again that they are exempted from this program. They don't have to worry about it. So they're not capturing data. Um, that might be one of those uh, cultural aspects that you have going on in your organization. So you could choose measures like MIPS Measure 226, Tobacco Assessment and Cessation, that does not include it in its denominators, uh, therapy services. So you can look for those. You could look at surgery uh, codes. We love um, uh, MIPS Measure 357, uh, that surgical site infection. So uh, again, if uh, you're going to do a 30-day look back outcome measure, which you need to do outcome measures, um, that might be something that you're looking at. So that's your first and second options here. Again, two different options, two slightly different outcomes. Just really depends on what you're going for. And our third example here, and I just want to toss this out because I get a lot of questions about it, is on a solo physician, and they're not participating with Medicare. But they do submit claims to Medicare as a non-participating cl clinician that accepts assignment, meaning the checks are sent to the physician's office and not to the patient. If they were sent to the patient that's called not accepting assignment. So in this scenario, let's say that the physician saw 300 Medicare patients as a non-participating Medicare uh, physician, and they received, uh, just for you know, argument's sake, $150,000 in Medicare allowables. So they would need to participate and report in the Medicare, uh, this Medicare program, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. Otherwise, they would experience for 2017 reporting a 4% cut on 2019 receipts and a 5% cut on 2018 data. Uh, that 5% cut would be on 2020 receipts. So just, again, ideas out there that, you know, this program is not just about Medicare participation. It's how many Medicare beneficiaries do you see?
So with that, um, I'm just going to quick check and see if there were any questions uh, that have come in now. If you do have a question, please enter your question into the questions pane on the uh, GoToMeeting field viewer. So while we're waiting for questions quickly, this was the end of my content that I had. So just wanted to highlight that we do have a number of events going on for you to check that out. You can check it out at scghealth.com. At the top, you'll see the events tab. And then if you're looking for other educational programs for give me 15 minutes, um, guess what? We've got a, a tab again, right on the top of the SCG Health dot com website and you can go and check out a number of different um, items there so i do see a couple of questions that have come in here let me see if i can get this all to pop out excellent um, so let's move on to our questions uh, so the first uh, item is uh, i have one physician one non-physician practitioner or one nurse practitioner and one physician assistant when i check the status the nurse practitioner and the pa are not required to submit but our physician is does this sound correct yes this does sound correct so a couple of things more than likely you are billing your nurse practitioner and physician assistant incident to the physician incident two is a medicare only billing concept where if there is a physician that is immediately available in the office suite therefore supervising under direct supervision those non-physician practitioners are billing as though they were the physician um, we did this for a number of reasons most specifically because it allows a higher reimbursement at the physician rate. So that's why we often do that. Um, but the, the big thing here is from Medicare's claims processing standpoint, they don't see the nurse practitioner and the physician assistant because they were billing as though they were the physician. So again, you have your two options. Um, this actually would be a perfect scenario. Um, actually not, let's not do example three, let's do example one. So it's the same example that you have um, here. For example, one is that you could either submit the data for all three clinicians or you as a group and, and do it under the tax identification number. So if at some point in the future, um, your clinicians were billing as your national under their national pride, uh, practitioner identifier more uh, frequently and not billing incident two because I'm continuing to worry about the incident two rules. Um, if you wanted to do that, you could do that as um, your option two and, and report as a group. Um, your other option would just to report your data for that individual physician. Um, just remember uh, when you're reporting, since you are reporting uh, on data that was received by Medicare under incident two, more than likely you are going to be reporting for all three clinicians under the physician's um, number. So just keep that in mind that you need to look at it from the way that Medicare would look at it. All right, so just uh, one more moment here on any other questions that come in because uh, that last question does absolutely sound correct. Uh, so just one more thing that I do wanna show you. So let me quickly go over to this wonderful CMS website, just because I wanna make sure that you know where you can go and get more information. So the website address is qpp.cms.gov. Um, you can see the, the very nice ladies here that are having a chat. And over on the right-hand side is the check your participation. Also, if you click on MIPS, you can check your participation and it takes you over to a link. So either place right now it is the 2017 data that you are looking up. Um, at some point, I would anticipate in April, letters will go out and uh, we'd anticipate this uh, lookup for status to be updated to be for 2017. So since I am not seeing any more questions here, um, I am going to go ahead and close out this session. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. For those of you that are watching the video archive, please remember to rate this video. To receive notices about upcoming Give Me 15 Minute programs or other educational sessions, please sign up at the top of scghealth.com. Thank you for joining me in this Give Me 15 Minute education program. This concludes the presentation. Thank you.